It's July 13th, 2020. This is Rook. Ask a few people of Iranian descent about how change can come or how we in the diaspora can support those in Iran, and you will likely hear something about us being unified or more often not unified. The question of Persian unity pervades almost every element and issue of Iranian life in the diaspora when it comes to our culture and ancestral home. This episode of Rook is dedicated to our ongoing discussion about finding solidarity, harmony, or social and political consensus amongst those of Iranian background, or whether that pursuit is a pipe dream or even a mistaken aspiration. Award-winning filmmaker Babak Payami joins me in the Rook studio. I'm Gian Gameshi. This is Rook. There, welcome to episode number twenty-six of Rook. Hi, Shaijun. Hi, thank you. How are you? I'm okay. Where's your keyboard? Bazam, you other, you forgot again, right? Yes. That that was every time we have this idea that you're yeah. just gonna speak through your the, the the piano, the little keyboard that we have for you. Yes, but uh, actually, I saw Bob. I can. <laughs> I lost my mind. <laughs> Vavak is in studio, although we're not going to turn on his mic until we... Uh, do you think people are catching on that the Monday shows are just you and me and the guests and the Thursday shows are the whole gang, the round table, the letters, um, the longer episodes? I think so, yeah. I wonder. Yeah. That's our plan. We'll let you in on it, those of you who are listening. Unwitting plan. Our, yeah. our, our, our unwritten, well, our <laughs> perhaps unwitting, but uh, now formalized plan is that Mondays are the the more direct show where we do one big interview and then the uh, Thursday shows are the whole shebang. A couple <laughs> yes. of interviews, letters, roundtable, yes. hijinks. Uh, you know, just talking to him outside of our studio a few minutes ago, I am guessing this is going to be an episode of Rook where... Uh, not everyone agrees with what our guest or what I have to say <laughs> that we were debating out there, but then uh, that's partly the point, right? Exactly. Okay. Exactly. Here we go. He's ready. Existence in the Iranian diaspora describes more than just geographical uprooting. There is social displacement, marginalization, and often an exilic sense of trying to find home. All of this, it seems, can lead to balkanization. Those of us who may all come from the same roots, existing in our separate and often opposing bubbles. It's no secret that there are differences among people of Iranian descent in the diaspora, sometimes regarding identification and ideas of belonging and home, sometimes in distinct patterns of social, cultural, and political interaction. We are not a monolith, but there are times, often in fact, that we would really benefit by playing nicely together, by achieving that collective, and yet that does not seem to come naturally to us. Is this unity really in our Iranian DNA, or is this some Something we can do something about? Well, there are perhaps few people better to ask this question of than Babak Payami, an award-winning Iranian-Canadian film director, screenwriter, and producer. Babak was born in Tehran and grew up in Iran and Afghanistan before leaving for Europe and subsequently Canada in the late 1980s to attend university and cinema studies. He then returned to Iran in 1998 and wrote, produced, and directed a troika of films that would gain huge acclaim. One More Day in 1999, Secret Ballot in 2001, and Silence Between Two Thoughts. That film, the third one, would go on to be confiscated by the Iranian government and force Babak into exile in the summer of 2003. 
Since his exile, Bobak has been involved in all manner of creative pursuits, including co-writing and directing the animated feature film Iqbal, A Tale of a Fearless Child, and co-producing and directing Manhattan Undying, a romantic drama about a vampire, which was released by Paramount Pictures in 2017. He's also been a compelling blogger and opinion writer, often discussing the Iranian community and our journey. Babak has received the Best Artistic Contribution at the Tokyo Film Festival, Special Jury Award at the Torino Film Festival, the Fipreski Prize at the London Film Festival, and of course, Best Director at the Venice International Film Festival for Secret Ballot. And right now, Babak Tayami joins me in the Rook studio in Toronto. Hello, sir. A wonderful good afternoon to you and, and your audience. Uh, and, and before we start, I should congratulate you on the new program, on the new digs here in, in, <laughs> in Toronto. And uh, I'm, I'm really happy and, uh, to be in this program and to be with you and participate in Thank you, a wonderful idea that you've got going. Here. Thank you so much. And you are, I, I don't know if you, I, I imagine you know this since you've been listening. I'm guessing you've got to be listening to every episode. Come of on. Of course, of course I am. <laughs> you would know that you're only our second in-studio guest that we've had. It's so nice to be able to look into someone's eyes. Wonderful. You're, I just you're risking COVID. Yes, yes, yes. Well, not with you. I just took my mask off just as we entered the studio and I'll be putting, duly putting my mask back on going out and hopefully we're going to get over this soon. Welcome. It's nice to have you here. Um, let me start with a blog post that you wrote a couple of weeks ago and I want to quote you. You said that until recently, I'm quoting you, I was disengaged, not out of indifference, but out of respect for those engaged activists whom I assume to be qualified in what they do. Unfortunately, I was disengaged to a fault. My fault was that I assumed that democracy will work without me until I reached a rude awakening. You go on to say that you feel the responsibility to be outspoken and get your hands dirty now with respect to Iran and the world. That was interesting to me. Uh, as the guy who made Secret Ballot, as the guy who fled Iran after his next film was confiscated by authorities, were you actually ever really disengaged? I wasn't disengaged as an artist. I was disengaged from stepping outside of the boundaries of what I think the artist should have in terms of social and political engagement. And we should, we should expand on that a little bit. Uh, I think that part of the problem that, that we face, particularly in the Iranian community, has to do with people acting and getting involved beyond their capacity. That's one issue that we'll, we're going to have to expand on and unpack during this conversation. The other thing has specifically to do with my view of the function and the limitations and the boundaries of an artist. I think an artist, a true artist, and this is my personal view, I don't want to expand on it and or, or prescribe for others, this is how I live my life. Mm -hmm. I think an artist should be highly in tune and engaged with his or her surroundings but never involved in politics. <laughs> There's a fine line there. And, and in the context of Iran, I'm talking about post-revolutionary Iran. Uh, I was too young to be able to comment about uh, the period before then. The, 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 the system and the flaws inherent in the system is such that they will politicize and contaminate the discourse with ideology and if artists are disciplined enough, they will overstep their boundaries of engagement to involvement. Okay. And that is where the big problem comes in my view. Okay, let's unpack that step by yeah. step. First of all, in this piece you wrote, as I quoted you, you said, until I reached a rude awakening. Yes. I'm curious what the awakening was. I will say that after the horrific downing of Flight 752 in January, uh, you, you were anything but disengaged. You were quite engaged. You were outspoken. You were hosting memorials. I, I saw you when we said hello at a couple. Uh, those were difficult days. You did not mince words. You said, for example, of the Iranian government, 41 years of a murderous death cult, thriving on violence, lies, deceit, grand-scale corruption. Uh, was that plane shooting a turning point for you? Uh, no, no. I think the turning point for me personally... Uh 
and it's 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 a difficult question because you, you see it it doesn't happen like that 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 you you say something snaps but after you the said fact rude you awakening drown. the rude awakening was was the moment where i felt okay now i have a responsibility to participate in community in the community and in the discourse of the iranian community or as a canadian citizen in the community at large beyond beyond my capacity as an artist. And when was that moment? Why was that moment? I think for me, as far as the Iranian community in Canada is concerned, that, that moment had to do in 1998, I think. 1998. Are you, do you mean 2009, the Green Movement exactly. and the Green Revolution? Exactly. I think for me at that point, I felt, okay, now uh, I'm never going to get involved with politics. I will never hold a flag or support a political party or support a political... I mean, and, and I think this, and, and thank you for helping me to, to crystallize that. The rude awakening was for me the moment where I observed a lot of artists in the community getting involved with politics. Mm -hmm. And I felt that my engagement with political issues and with social issues and the difference of opinion that I have where we as artists should be like canaries in the, in the mine. We should always be hyper idealistic. We should never get involved between pragmatic political choices of this one is better than that, choosing between the two bads. Which so one when, is bad so, so which if one you is say worse. 41, if you call the Iranian government 41 years of a murderous death cult, yes, that's not getting involved in politics? It is getting involved in politics, and I'm saying it now publicly, but uh, I always believe. I mean, I I'm not going to use the capital I have with respect to the audience and the people who respect or disrespect my work and sell them something else. As, as somebody who, who is in the public eye and who works with X number of people who are interested in your work, they have bought into your brand let's say that for example you're not going to be overtly ideological and exactly. hammer home a message exactly. right right I, as a matter of fact i think ideology is is essentially poisonous to 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 art and and i an artist who gets who, who gets involved in ideology who gets affected or buys into ideology can never function as an artist. This is my personal view. Again, well, I'm well, not going to... Well, th that's interesting because I, I, I want to pick up on this because at the same time as you were making such pointed statements about the Iranian government in the, in the shadow of that downing of the, of the flight, uh, you also said in an interview at that time in January of this year, uh, Artists need to speak out, but I think part of the responsibility of the artist is to maintain the discipline, not to step over the boundaries of partisanship and ideological contamination of the discourse to make sure that humanity remains the essence of what we're trying to do here. Something similar to what you've just yes. said. The, the obvious question that begs out of that is how do we keep the balance, how do you keep the balance of being responsible and active as an artist and not fall into partisanship? Our community is anything but nonpartisan, right? The, 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 it's a minefield of, of partisanship. So how do you accomplish that? I find that it's a challenge. I find that many artists who fall in the trap of partisanship uh, and become ideo uh, de facto ideolo ideologues have not overcome that challenge. I remind myself every day of my boundary that A, ideology and partisanship is poison to my function and my life as an artist. I never get involved in that. And simultaneously, and this is where the balancing act comes in, I have to be engaged with the issues in my surroundings. And I have to be aware of the partisan and ideological poison that exists in that discourse in my surroundings. And I have to function within my capacity as an artist. But you surely you realize that in our diaspora, certainly in the diaspora that I know, uh, any opinion that you, I mean, the choice is not always yours to be seen as partisan or not partisan. It is projected onto you. I yes. mean, uh, isn't the, as I say, isn't the diaspora just full of partisanship or, uh, or what I would maybe call uh, political and social factionalism? Uh, which I'm, I, I have continually tried to fight against, but even with this program, that at its core, 
has a commitment to being nonpartisan. And I can honestly say I've never been part of any particular party or, or faction. That's been the advantage of having one foot out of the Iranian community for so many years. I can come to this and say, really, I'm not part of any, any particular group. This program has been called all kinds of things, depending on which guests we have on. Yes. Oh, they're funded by the Saudis or they're supporters of the Shah or they must be reformists now because they had this guy on. They go light on the regime. It's almost like you cannot do or say anything in the Iranian community without being pigeonholed. So how do you escape that? I should say this astute observation that you made has also to do with the question that you asked about my rude awakening, because I was sitting and complaining about this issue, and I felt now I have a responsibility to participate to solving that. In other words, breaking the cycle of partisanship. And, and I think in this in the small, smaller microcosm of the Iranian-Canadian community, we can start that process of influencing our surroundings and breaking that cycle of partisanship. I think it's very important that those of us who, who see the world this way, who see the world without partisan uh, glasses, let's say, partisan... Uh, right. Or want uh, to. I mean, or, or we, we, want to. We all, yeah. tr- we all, none of us yeah. is objective entirely, but y- we, we can try. You see, here's the, here's the problem. And, and it, it partly has to do with the subject that, that I understood that this, this discussion is on. Uh, migrant commu- immigrant communities uh, essentially are faced with a few different challenges. One is the, 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 the pain of alienation. The second is, uh, a, a disjuncture between qualification and position. For example, I might come here as an immigrant. I might be a PhD in, in astrophysics or whatever, but because of my lack of knowledge culturally and my uh, linguistic inabilities, I might not be able to exceed in this society as much as I deserve to do sure. with my credentials. Sure. There's the reverse as well. I might be somebody who has Uh, for example, economic advantages, relatively speaking. And then I might be marginally interested, which will touch on another typical weakness that we have identified. I might be marginally interested in certain issues. And I use my uh, economic advantage as a businessman or what have you, and step over the boundaries of getting involved in things that is beyond my capacity. And a lot of immigrant societies have this situation. Some businessman, let's say, and I don't, I don't mean it as a, 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 a mean to demean business mm-hmm. people. Uh, some business person might might be, come here and become a multimillionaire, so he has some time on his hands, and he uses that time to gain a certain influence in certain aspects of of activity in the community that is beyond his capacity, beyond his knowledge and wherewithal. And I think that- But isn't that knowledge, true of every community? Or every, every, I mean, not just the Iranian community? It becomes exaggerated with immigrant communities. Hmm. And, and I think that exaggerated disjuncture in terms of qualification, position, interest, aptitude, in, and other aspects of it, causes, can lead to certain problems. And one of the criticisms that I, and, and, and I think the name of your program being Rock, mm-hmm. uh, uh, Frank and go Outspoken, for it. Go for I, it. I have to go for it here. If I don't go for it here, <laughs> I would be betraying okay. sure. the, the program. Uh, you will be hard pressed. You will be hard pressed if you have a gathering of several Iranians, especially Iranians beyond a certain age, Mm-hmm. 40, 45, let's mm-hmm. say, in that demographics, from a variety of backgrounds and specialties, you would be hard pressed to bring up any subject and hear anybody in that room saying, I don't know anything about that subject. <laughs> I can right. gather 10 Iranians around the table. I can bring up a Mars mission. I can bring up <laughs> neurosurgery. Uh, right. I, right. All of them are Why are we like them. that? Okay, and, and let's, let's get into Because I will add on to that, yes. and I've said this previously on this program, but I'll, I'll keep saying it. We also have, uh, as part and parcel of that, that men, I know everything about everything, you know, uh, is this superiority complex, right? Uh, like, uh, you, you're, 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 you're drinking coffee, we'll say, oh, coffee has more money to get. We're, we're, yeah. We invented coffee, you know. Whatever it is, it'll come from Iran. And of course, the flip side of someone who is always celebrating themselves, or Tarif Mikunan, is that there's an inferiority complex 
In other words, uh, somebody who really knows everything about everything, it, it probably doesn't talk about it at the party, right? So that's the paradox that is continually something we're grappling with. And and it goes back, I don't remember, the, uh, it just came to my mind right now, and I don't remember who wrote this, but a, a, a historian, a Roman era historian, had uh, written about the conflict between Rome and the ancient Persian Empire. And he, his observation, I wish I would have remembered the name, and, and his observation was, this battle was ferocious, the Persians fought a, an amazing battle, I cannot for sure say if they were brave, but I can say they are amazingly clever and, I and, and, and innovative. Hmm. This is the historian in the Roman times we're saying. And, and I think it, it's, it's a good characteristic, it's a positive characteristic, the ambitiousness, the, the, uh, the, 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 the energetic approach to everything that Iranians, hot-bloodedness that exists in the, in, and, and I don't want to over, uh, are generalized uh, and, and paint everything with the same brush because I think we should touch on the topic of diversity here as, ve as well. But I think it's, it's not necessarily a bad thing. I think sometimes it manifests itself. And, and let me just open a parenthesis here. If you look, I, I'm involved right now with, as a result of this, this uh, devastating situation of flight PS752. Mm -hmm. I'm involved with very directly and closely with the families uh, of the victims. Mm -hmm. And uh, several of them are dentists. And I was pleasantly surprised and, and, and not shocked to hear that year after year in the Canadian dental examinations to get certified as a dentist, without exception, there is several Iranians in the top 10 and mostly in the top three. I believe it. So you can't say that, that you know, uh, this is not deserved. It comes from the same passion and the same drive and the same uh, sense of achievement. Commitment and, and, uh, to try commitment to find to excellence, sure. And I think historically, uh, this is partly why I think, if you look at it, uh, out of the great empires, uh, the going back to, and, and I, I want to be careful about you know borderline, uh, not become what I criticize as being jingoistic about Iranian history, mm -hmm. but out of the, the, the great empires, the Roman Empire, the Greek Empire, the Persian Empire, the Persians have maintained more of their ancient history and culture than the for example, Egyptians or the Greeks or the Romans. And part of it, and a lot of it has to do with the diversity that is within the DNA of the Iranian identity. Well, uh, okay. I mean, I know what you're saying, but yes. I also have a pet peeve with, no, we're great. Why are we great? Because 3,000 years ago, <laughs> <laughs> you know, when the example is always, I mean, even when we're talking about no, poetry no. And, and referencing Hafez and Rumi, Thank I kind of glaze over a little bit and go, come on. this." And let me, let me just put it, try this. And I'm not saying we shouldn't respect that lineage, by the way. I'm just saying we can't point that far back. Uh, we can't always use that as our crutch either. Let me, let me. When you when you talk about the people in the room and we talk about partisanship and everybody being labeled and, and positioned, I wonder and I'm not gonna say this in a in a probably in a very educated way, there's probably some academic who could has a term for this, I don't know. But is it partly that we currently don't have um what Chomsky would call a threat of a good example. You know, you you wanted to call secret ballot necessary illusions uh, after that Chomsky series back in 2001. I remember he used to talk about uh, one of the reasons why the United States doesn't want Cuba to work, you know, is because uh, it would be a threat of a good example that uh, Americans would look at that and go, wait a minute, why aren't we like that society? And we we can't even agree on which Iran was is the Iran that we would we would want. But you know, that's a good there's, thing. That's that's actually, I, but but that's the seed of the disunity. That even he even when people are either um, no one necessarily thinks the current situation is great, um, and, and and those who want to change it are either throwing back to something that um, may have never existed, or throwing ahead to something that doesn't exist yet. And so there's this scramble to try and untangle ourselves from trying to figure out, I mean, compared to the average German or, or Canadian, and these are extreme exaggerations, I admit, but you know, uh, having lived in Canada for many years, uh, most Canadians would go, 
this is this country is great. It's, it's working as it is. We got some problems here with this and this, is, but we all agree that we like it as it is. We don't have that right now. Yes. So, so in a way, we can be forgiven for the disunity, but the partisanship doesn't help. Uh, let's actually step a little bit back because I was hoping that we get into this conversation. Right. And and I, I must reference that I said I'm borderline jingoistic. I, I'm not talking about our history in that sense. I'm saying our current state has a lot to do with our DNA. So on the previous discussion, we can continue that. But I think this is a perfect topic. The word unity, and if you recall a, few, a couple of years ago, if, if it wasn't last year, the year before, Tirgon's theme that I also had to do last year, the summer last of 20, year was, 2019, was, yeah. yes, was, was about unity. Mm -hmm. And I emphasized uh, a unity and diversity. In Persian, they call it vahdat dar takassur. And I think we have to, uh, and, and I have rarely heard this converse, this topic being discussed, so I really hope that you and I can, can bring it to some point where more learned people can ex expand on. When people could have a better version of this conversation. Yes, yes. <laughs> right, smart people. Smart. <laughs> so the, the understanding of the expression unity, there's an authoritarian view of unity, which I think is the predominant view, predominant reading in the Iranian context. In other words, for the typical Iranian, Unity means everybody has to agree with me. There's an authoritarian version of the expression unity. Because of a hist long history, uh -huh. part of it has to do because we were constantly overtaken by foreign powers and oppressed. Part of it has to do because the, the problem is not uh, on a microcosmic level within Iranian society because Iran, and this goes back to that topic that, that you challenged me on, uh, you will you you cannot define the Persian or Iranian identity without taking into consideration the deeply ingrained diversity within the Iranian identity. In other words, there is no way you can uh, excise Azerbaijani and say that's Iranian. There is no way you can uh, ignore Arabs or. Afghanis or Asuris or uh, no way Mumazandarani, Gilani, Baluchi, Kurdish. The Iranian identity is defined by its diversity. There is no unified, homogenous rather, there's no homogenous Iranian identity in terms of culture, in terms of ethnics, in terms of religion. And, and so on and so forth. Do you forth. think that most Iranians would agree with you saying that? I don't care if most Iranians agree with me. It's the reality. It's the <laughs> fact. We have, we, uh, and this is where I go back and I say I, I don't want to be misconstrued as being jingoistic about Iranian culture. When I go back to history, I'm studying the, the, the DNA mm. of the Persian or Iranian identity. And I'm jumping back and forth because I don't want you to get letters about Persian or Iranian or whatever you want to call sure, it. Sure. But there's no way you can define the Persian or Iranian identity without taking into consideration the enormous diversity that that identity has. And, and it's not even a national. I, I, in a way, Iran is beyond national. The definition of Iran or Iranian is not national like a flag or a boundary of a border, is, is uh, fundamentally diverse. Mm. And I think it is that diversity that is averse to the authoritarian view of the expression unity. But somehow unity is top down. It's it's yeah that that, that unity that means version. conformity. Yes, yeah, means yeah, conformity. Yeah. Means yeah. all of you have to. And if you realize that is where I say historically the Iranians have survived because every time the 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 be it foreign powers that have invaded Iran, be it leaders who have taken advantage of circumstances, or however you want to uh, interpret history, the reason they have never survived. And the reason we're having this conversation right now is because within the Iranian DNA, without any leadership, without any ideology, without any prescription, without us being self-conscious about it, we are averse to any sense of homogenization, any sense of unity in the authoritarian sense. But we're also somewhat averse to trying to work this out, trying to talk, talk about it. Uh, uh, let me tell you what I mean by that. Um, 
you know, there's this feeling. I, look, we're we're a the, the the Iranian diaspora for obvious reasons. There's scars there. There's scars that come from week after week, twice a week. We do an episode of Rook, and I kind of expected this, but I'm shocked that every single person who comes on, mostly really interesting, successful people, have some crazy story of having to escape or some really dark example of what happened in their family or their life. Or Everyone has these scars, and maybe that's what leads to this feeling of let's not air the dirty laundry and have these conversations, you know, uh, I in, welcome in, this in, conversation. in public. Yeah. But but then we never have the conversation, right? Yeah. And I can tell you, even in the lead up to launching Rook, when I was um, talking to people, I went around and, you know, went around North America actually and asked people, what what kind of, what, what do you think of a program like this? Would this work for you? Are you interested in this? People of Iranian background. And you know a few people said, Babak, they said, Jian uh, it sounds good, but why don't you do something celebrating Iranians? Why do you always have to talk about the bad things, you know, that uh, we might be this way or that way? Uh, this almost like denial, and you, and you kind of get it, because why give fodder to those who want to characterize us as uh, stereotype us or, or say negative things? Why, you know, give them that fodder? This conversation could be taken by somebody who doesn't understand anything about Iranian culture. And see, they're always fighting. I told you, even they admit it themselves. But... We have to be able to have these conversations. And that's Absolutely. why I welcome the kind of input that you've started to give in the community and to realize that we don't have to stomp out of the room if we disagree with yeah. each other, right? Uh, let's make the space to have these conversations. And remember, by now, at my age, I'm, I'm more disciplined than before about not overstepping my boundaries. I think I'm speaking well within my boundaries and it also relates to the rude awakening that you mentioned because I've always been waiting and sitting for somebody else to say that these things that I'm thinking and I thought, why shouldn't I engage in this conversation? Because in a sense, for me, this is a cultural conversation, not a political conversation. Okay. We have to acknowledge that as long as we have a, a reading of unity as conformity and not unity as acknowledgement of differences, that we're unified in the fact that we're different, we have, we have opposing possibly and, and diverse points of view, we have diverse cultures, we have diverse, especially Iranians should be best at it to find unity in diversity. And somehow, somewhere, something, within the Iranian society, which I think is a, is a minority, but it's having larger than its size ramifications and negative influences, there's this insistence of, as long as we're not unified, in other words, we agree to on one thing and we accept what I say, or we have one leader that we wholeheartedly and blindly agree, and the Iranian DNA is averse to that. Iranians, without knowing it, will never homogenized culturally but, but there or are times when operating as the collective yes is important and is essential times of crisis times when uh, uh, somebody needs help times when we can harness the collective power socially economically or even politically. and do you think the Iranians um, have not risen up to the challenge in these occasions um, sometimes give me an example where Iranians haven't um, I I I I feel bad about saying this, but even even that desperately horrible event of the plane shooting down, even in the Toronto Greater Toronto area, there were disagreements about who's going to have the memorials and where and what they're going to be like. I mean, you know that. But but we're, we're, uh, okay. You cannot uh, here. Let's let's actually clarify one thing. You cannot take macro level observations and apply them to the micro level. Well, I'm talking, if there about, are I'm talking about the micro 20 level. People, we're talk, if we're talking about the micro level. Where is the macro level? You, 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 you think that there's a macro level? You think that the Iranian diaspora is uni united right now, for example, on how to uh, provide support for the people of Iran? Do you really do I you think, think that? I think they are. You really? have to look at the end result. I think that, uh, look, look at it this way. Every time Iran has faced a major challenge, the Iranian people... And somehow the Iranian identity has risen to the challenge. Let's give an ex extreme example. There is no worse conditions, and I know I'm overstepping my, my, my qualifications here, but it's good to <laughs> reference it. There is no worse example in recent history than the war between you know, Iran and Iraq. Sure. Because Iran was in a desperate situation. It was 
politically, socially, culturally in a in a in a moment of upheaval. And but the Iranian people, despite the the abhorrent leadership, despite all of the problems that existed in Iran, they rose up to the challenge to defend their country. However, well, you well, want to put the, 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 it. Look at the BAM yeah, example. Look at I, all the I, the BAM was Iranians the first time. Are the most By the way, I people. can't possibly speak for Iranians in Iran. I grew up outside of Iran. Uh, neither can I. I can speak as someone in the Iranian diaspora. Uh, I grew up, you know, being an Iranian self identified, didn't have a choice, seen that way since I was a kid. The hostage crisis, revolution, there he is, the terrorist kid, etc. And grew into that yeah. proudly, loved yeah. my Iranian background. But the BAM in 2003 was the first time that I saw that kind of um, collective unity, and it meant a lot to me. But I, uh, I don't believe that, or, or I, I want to believe that um, that kind of support and collective um, consciousness that you're talking about exists. But all I can go by is what I've experienced and what I've seen. And I'm telling you, we do this show every week. What's the, what, what are we constantly hearing from people? I, I got no support from the community when I started this uh, um, theater production of the Shah Nameh. I, I got, I got no support from the community the when I needed their help uh, doing this. Uh, there, there was a dispute when I wanted the, the community to, to bring my film out. It didn't work. I mean, the, you know, we're, we're not exactly the blueprint for culturally for a community that comes together and supports each other in the artistic and cultural realm. You'll concede that. Right? I agree. I agree. I have this. I mean, I, I have I have the same complaints and the same. But I think we're analyzing the problem, or I want to analyze the problem in a different way. It ha it's a top down issue. Leadership in our society and in our culture and our history has been the biggest problem, not the masses. Mm. You have. So, I mean. Granted, we have educational issues, we have issues with, with respect, to, uh, cultural issues with respect to an abhorrent view of religion and the, the, the dominance of religion and in, in every aspect of people's lives. But I think all of that has to do with the flaws that leadership has had in Iran and in Iranian history, because rarely, if ever, there has been a, there has been a, leader in Iran who acknowledged the diversity, who acknowledged the differences, and who appreciated it. There has always been this, even the, the current regime, for example, there's this insistence on homogenizing and making uniform a society that is fundamentally not able to homogenize and not able to conform to a unified vision, politically, culturally, historically. I say this to a lot of my non-Iranian friends, especially those who know less about Iran. Close your eyes, put, put a pin on any point on the map of Iran, and extend a, a, a diameter of 250 kilometers in every, any direction. People speak completely different languages. Hmm. There is such ethnic diversity in Iran. Whoever says that the Iranian, the Iran has one religion is lying to themselves. Iran has fundamentally has had multiple religions and multiple ethnicities within its identity. Let me pr press pause for a second, sure. because maybe no, not everybody listening knows the story of Babak Payami. Uh, and so let, let's come back to unity and disunity. And sure. I, I, let me get into some of your story. Mm -hmm. um, and we'll, we'll have to do it briefly. We'll have to do the proper Babak Payami story at some point. But you, you were born like me a, a little bit before the revolution. How would you characterize growing up in Iran, and why did you end up leaving the first time as a young man? Well, I left Iran three times, actually. One was when I was, I don't know, six, seven years old, and it was because of my father's uh, work in the Iranian oil company. And that was Afghanistan. That was Afghanistan. The Iranian, the, uh, Iran basically um, controlled civil aviation in Afghanistan, and, and my father was worked for the Iranian oil company in that. The second time I left Iran was shortly after the revolution. And the third time I left Iran was after silence between two thoughts was confiscated. Yes. And every time had a different reason. The first time, I had nothing to do with it. The second time, I also didn't directly have anything to do with it, but I was a hot-headed young man uh, who didn't experience the gradual uh, lead up to the revolution. We came back to Iran in 1981 after the revolution. So 
for me it was much more difficult to assimilate in that situation and, and probably the family and like many others like me uh, at that time decided that he's never going to survive here or he's not going to uh, better were you a creative really. kid were you did you have uh, did you know that you're going to come become a filmmaker when you were a teenager say in iran i unfortunately have the most boring typical story every <laughs> filmmaker says i was nine years old and my father gave me a super eight millimeter camera and i never looked back <laughs> that, unfortunately i don't have a more that's not as boring as i became an engineer uh, yeah and, no, and then no, left to, you yeah. know, but close no, but yeah. ever since Ever since I was nine years old, I was just fascinated with this projection on the wall. So why were you why were you hot headed? Uh, I don't know. This is not a question that I can answer. I think I was I was I. I In what I've, way? In what way were you hot headed? Well, I think I'm fundamentally a, a, a nonconformist. Hmm. I'm fundamentally, you tell me I can't do something, and that's that's what I'm going to be doing. And I remember that my parents criticism of me especially my mother was ever since you were a toddler you would just you know rage about that so part of it has to do with that part of it obviously is 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 uh, upbringing i remember i mean my generation is borderline i'm born in 1966 and my parents are very progressive i must say this that to this day and my parents are over 80 years old i am still uh uh, the Farsi expression is kam miyaram. I'm still when I when I converse and have a discussion with my parents, they're much more progressive and forward thinking than I am. Where and are I they? think that's an are exception. They they're in Iran right in Iran. now. So what did your progressive parents think when you said I'm leaving as a teenager? Uh, at that time, which is the second time, my second uh, Well the first time leaving. you went with the, the family. The first time I was the second a kid. time you I was came like by six, yourself, didn't years you? Old. I came by myself, but they had to do with it. I think it was as much their decision as it was my decision. I was not as self-conscious about the dangers of living in Iran at that time in 1981. But so so you le you're with your parents blessing post yes. post revolution young Bobak leaves uh, yes. to 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 the west, uh, to Europe, to Canada. Uh a couple of decades passed. Uh, the extraordinary part of your journey is that you, your most famous work you do back in Iran. Yeah. So you decide, so what, what becomes the precipitant in 1998, um, or is it the rude awakening that you mentioned earlier, to go back to Iran? Is that where you roll up your sleeves and you say, I've, I have to do something about this country? I, I, no, no, the rude awakening was after the fact. In fact, it had nothing to do with filmmaking. I was completely immersed in the, the trials and tribulations of an up-and-coming filmmaker in Canada. How do I get in, a foot into Telefilm Canada and who the, knows who to be able to do that? I was in fact a volunteer for TIFF since 1989 or something to that effect, right. maybe even 88. My going back to Iran had to do with the fact that my family did not want me to, to uh, be so alienated. I had a lot of difficulty. I was politically very, very self-conscious and, and, and again, hot-headed in that aspect as well. I had a very, uh, at least in my own view, a very clear opinion about what the situation in mm -hmm. Iran is. And, and, and I mean, because again, this is rock, uh, without ever having been in Iran in, 19, uh, in the 1980s, where there was this reformist movement, I founded a farce. And in fact, uh, Necessary Illusions, the, t the working title Necessary mm -hmm. Illusions, and my borrowing from Professor Chomsky in my interpretation of the situation in Iran was that in Iran, under the circumstances, that authoritarian regime with the trajectory that it has and the international dynamics has to create the necessary illusion of reform and moderation in order to manufacture consent domestically and internationally in order to guarantee its own survival. Okay. My parents coming from an old family, and by that time a lot of the grandparents and older generation were dying off and were becoming old, and, and my parents did not want me to be disconnected. 
and they insisted that I should at least maintain some connection with my country, come back and forth, come back and visit the family. You know, when we talk about artists, and, and obviously my uh, being a musician, my first familiarity is with musical artists. Musical artists famously have fertile periods, right? Yes. David Bowie's Berlin years, yes. the the Beatles in that middle period, or whatever. You look at it, the Radiohead from 2007 to this time. So, uh, you would appear to have had a really fertile period from 1999 to 2002, where you make these three films. Yes. What happened? I went back to Iran. Uh, one thing leads to the other, and the, for the first time, within a matter of days. There, something happens, and I had to get on a public bus in Tehran. And I get on this public bus, and remember, it's 20 years that I have a medan. Back then, I was a kid. So, and there's this metal rod, this pole in the middle of the bus. Women go to the front of the bus, give their ticket to the driver or whoever the attendant is, and then walk to the back door. They get on the back side with this metal rod separating the men on the front side. And I got on this bus and I'm making an observation because in taxis and minibuses in Iran, these are the contradictions that you see. People are sitting like in close quarters, but on the bus they have to be separated like this. And uh, in a very busy downtown Meiduna Shapur kind of uh, ambience, crowded hot summer or late summer, and this young man and woman were outside waiting to get on, pushing and shoving also. And I understood just from their body language that they had something between them that nobody should know. Mm. And they got on the bus from opposite sides, made their way, snaked their way through the crowd, pushing and shoving, sweaty, and got to this metal pole. I was sitting near it. Hmm. And they put their hands on this metal pole. One, the, the girl on this side and the man on that side. And these hands were sort of creeping closer and closer, but never touching. And they had this deep romantic conversation without uttering a word by just breathing and looking and looking away it's just this nudge of a smile and then they got out of the bus and i missed my stop and i lost my way until i had to come and i observed them walking exactly the way i saw i, I depicted it in one more day and i saw them walking away the wow. girls a few steps forward uncharacteristic of males and females and the man a few steps back I called my dear friend Jafar Panahi and I said, Jafar, this is my next film. I'm going to make it in Iran. And he says, what is this? And, and remember for him, child, the fuful as kharaj, you know, what are you talking about? Right. And just uh, in case anybody doesn't know, Jafar Panahi, the, the great Iranian filmmaker. Absolutely. Yeah. So he, he, he doesn't know what quite to make of your diagram that you've Yeah. Talked. And I said, look, this film starts at 4.45 a.m. one morning at the bus stop. A man comes at the bus stop, and a woman comes into this bus stop, and they get on a bus stop. Uh, they get on a bus and drive away. And every day we go forward. There are no flashbacks in this film. Every day we go forward. The next day we start a little bit earlier, and we extend a little bit further into where are these two going. And we learn that the guy is a prisoner, and the woman works in a hospital with suicide. You know. And as I was just saying this, Jafar said. Babak, you got to make this. This is just like the form enough is the form alone is enough to and introduced me to a gentleman uh, and, and by the name of Ali Reza Shujanuri. And that's how I made that film. I love that you saw that. I love that you saw that on the on the bus. Uh, that, so then uh, now that's a you have a, a pretty strong debut with that, but it's secret ballot that really puts you on the the map internationally and the Venice Prize and all of that. Uh, and let me ask you about uh, secret ballot. This is the, this is this riveting film um, from two thousand one. By the way, um, in the lead up to this interview, uh, I, I knew I had to watch. Oh, I have to watch Bob X films, uh, and I started watching secret ballot, and I, and I thought. I've seen this twice. <laughs> I, I had forgotten <laughs> that. I don't know if it had. A, uh, I was thinking of the Farsi name or something, but but it is such a beautiful film. Thank you. And and I don't know if you've kept up with the, that cast and stuff. They're just. It, it's a, it's a very it's a riveting film. It's still still riveting. I think the first time I saw it was probably twenty years ago. You know, uh, and this film looks at the struggle to bring the mechanics of voting and 
election to disorganized in rural parts of Iran, and specifically a young woman clad in chador roaming around these desert conditions trying to collect votes on an election day and re- relying on a fascist vehicle, literally, to spread a notion of democracy uh, uh, among the laity. Uh, I think I've learned a little bit about what you're going to answer here based on our conversation over the last hour, but uh, has the message or intent of what you wanted to do with that film changed as you look back at it 20 years later? I'm so sorry to say no. No. I wish it had. I wish I was wrong or I wish I would be proven wrong and I wish that film would still, would no longer be relevant. I sincerely wish that. It wasn't a political film. The part that's making you say, I'm sorry to say, it hasn't changed. Tell us what that is. Well, remember, before 2001 or 2000, when I endeavored to make that film, and I made that film during the U.S. elections in the November Mm -hmm. time. And so I was keeping up with that. And the U.S. elections has a little bit to do with something that I improvised and added to that film as well. Uh, Way back. The Bush-Gore election. Yes. And and that whole situation. Yes. Way back in an, an I like that we're still maintaining the spoiler alert. Yes. Uh, Twenty years later, we're like, but don't say what happens in the film in case yeah. somebody wants to check it out. <laughs> no, I think I think you that can find film, Secret Ballad, by the way, on uh, Amazon, and you know, it's it's still it's very worth watching. Thank uh, you. Wh- for wh- the what's plug. the far- Farsi name? Raya Mahfi. Raya Mahfi. Raya Mahfi. Uh, so, uh, remember, so way back, even before I started making films, I w- I was very opinionated about something, and I was in a minority, in a very small minority, in fact, uh, in my opinions and view of the situation in the 1980s into the 1990s. So essentially, I didn't buy, uh, to, p- to put it concisely, and I don't know if this program of yours, how long it's gonna go, but I, I, I didn't buy into the, into the farce of reformism. I did not buy into that. I found that a survival mechanism kicking in. I found that to be, they had to create the necessary illusion only of reform and moderation because the foreigners would not play ball with them. They cannot continue their foreign relations and trade and all of those things. And I I said I won't open the can of worms. In order to manufacture some abhorrent sense of consent, as they did, among many Iranians who bought into that, which was the thesis behind secret ballot. Whether or not the, the, the process of elections is a departure point or a point of arrival within the democratic discourse. In other words, if you have a box and a piece of paper and people come and line up and throw a piece of paper in that box, do you have democracy? How fundamental is that to democracy? Yeah, right, right. Exactly. Or, or is it a passive expression of, uh, of nothingness? Yeah. 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 And, 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 I, and I go back to something else that I said, and I think all of these threads to a listener who has the patience to listen to the entire program today with us, he, will be able, he or she will be able to connect the dots. Mm-hmm. The question was that just reducing democracy to elections, reducing democracy to the point of a piece of paper in a ballot box without taking a holistic view of it, is in reductive. my view, is, is reductive. And, and going back to the other dot that I created, there's a very thin line between fascism and democracy. As a matter of fact, in recent history, in modern history, 20th century history, all fascistic regimes have come into power through the process of elections, have maintained power with 98% hmm. uh, but there's uh, a, there's voter another, turnout. There's another side to secret ballot though, isn't there? Which is that the woman, the, the, the subject, the main yes. subject in the film, who is steadfastly, defiantly trying to get these votes, you know, to put in her box to, to do her job as a, uh, what would you call them, a scrutineer or something, yeah. uh, election. Uh, She's so determined, she so believes in it, I mean, perhaps naively, um, that it's quite beautiful. I mean, she wants this to work. Yes. She wants to count as many people as possible to get their Shenas Nameh, to make sure that they vote, to put their name down, because she thinks this is important. That's actually an uplifting message. If she is the Iranian people or the people of the diaspora, um, I, I'm, I would be very happy with that desperately trying to achieve this, you know, even when 
you zoom out and look at it and, and, and it seems a little ridiculous what she's doing, right? Thank you for not making me say it and thank you for saying it because that, that's, that's correct, that's true. And even in the soldier, I mean, I fundamentally take a humanistic view, not a moralistic view in, in terms of judging the character. The, uh, the girl is naive. The girl is f apparently futile what she's doing, but her steadfastness and her yes. belief, as yeah. naive as it is. So before we, I, I, I want to come back to uh, not just unity, but the notion of compromise and being an artist. Uh, yes. But just before we do that, just wrap up the story of how you end up coming back to the West because Secret Ballot comes out. It's it's a critical success. Um, you're you're feted around the world. You win this Best Director Prize at Venice, which which is enough to make careers. You know, uh, you set about making this this film, Silence Between Two Thoughts, and you get arrested. Yes. So what happens there? Having grown up in Afghanistan. I had a story in mind that I'd written during my school days in 1994-1995 that was loosely based on Heart of Darkness about an Afghani man, a construction worker, who is so humiliated and so wronged in Iran as a construction worker that he decides that he has to leave and the only way that he can is to go and find bin Laden. This is a story that I'd written in 1994, 95. Wow, yeah. To find bin Laden, kill him, so that he will have a country to live in because the Iranians, he's had enough of the belittlement that the Iranians have. Then September 11 happened. And, and September 11 happened on the day of the premiere of Secret Ballot at the Toronto International Film Festival. Oh, I remember <laughs> this now. I actually remember this. There you go. Because uh, it was a, everything, everyone was in shock. Yeah. There was a, the, the whole festival was pl placed on pause and it was your film was, yeah. yes, I remember this. So Venice ends in this great climax of me winning five different awards and here I am, you know, having made it in the Venice Film Festival and I land in Toronto and I'm looking forward, all the friends and relatives to everything. This is my hometown. TIFF is where I used to volunteer. Now my film is being shown here. Of course, the other film was shown as well. But uh, September 11th happened. At that time, I wanted to, to, to talk about the situation in Afghanistan. I wanted to, to, to portray what I feel uh, as someone who grew up there, bring my perspective to what Afghanistan is mm -hmm. really like. And, and the, the, the complications. Do you have an affection this was for a very, Afghanistan? I, absolutely. I'm, I'm in love with that country and the people. And, and I've had the best experiences of my life over there. And, I'm, and I, I must say, again, going back to my uh, loyalty to your, to your, to your uh, theme, Rock, uh, to be frank, I am shocked, embarrassed by how Afghans are treated in Iran. I apologize to every single Afghan who has been wronged in Iran. And I have a lump in my throat just having to say this. And I wish I could go and apologize from every single uh, Afghan person who has been wronged in Iran. And I truly feel bad about this as, as an Iranian. Having said that, and with September 11th happening, I felt now I'm sort of, I'm not uh, telling a fresh story. I'm not bringing, because remember, by 2001, I don't think anybody would even recognize the name Bin Laden in the normal. And I thought I'm onto something, mm -hmm. but it just take me Took me a few years. Suddenly, to the be film able to becomes make it. reactive. Becomes okay, reactive, right. and I didn't want to do it. I sat down, and I reworked the third act of that film. The third act of that film begins with him arriving at a village, in the mountains of which he believes Bin Laden exists. That he's gotten so close to be able to go and assassinate. But in the village, they're executing people, and there's this beautiful young girl that they're executing, and he has spent the good part of the last couple of days there. And he asks around, that was in the original story, which I rewrote into Silence Between Two Thoughts. He goes and, and, and tries to do something about it. So he goes and convinces the Haji, beats him at his own game. If you execute, uh, and if someone you execute has to go to hell. And if you execute a virgin, she will go to heaven. So the, the Haji is embarrassed because he's gotten the upper hand, the ideological, he's beat him at his own game, and he marries the girl to the executioner. 
the, the third act of my film essentially became the opening of Silence Between Two Thoughts, and I made Silence Between Two Thoughts. And at that time, I, I could have, and, and in hindsight, I don't regret it, despite everything that happened to me. To right. this day, if I have the chance to make f films in Iran, I would not trade it with anything else. I would, I would, I would, in a heartbeat, I would go and make films in Iran if I could and if they would let me. But what happened? I mean, why were you, what was the pretense for arresting you? I, to be honest, I, I never got an explanation. <laughs> And, and I, I m maybe in, the, in another program where we get more into the bushes, so yeah, to say, of yes. my career in films, I will tell you, just imagine the last act of the film Goodfellas, where he's running around and looking after the helicopters yeah. and making spaghetti. And that, those are the circumstances I got arrested. Was it, was it almost like you were too successful with the, the, the previous film? I, I can't say. You, you really can't say? 20 well, years later, you can't? Well, well, look, first of all, they have to explain for what they did. Uh -huh. I think history proves that anybody who is independent, who doesn't play ball with them, uh, because, because culture for them, for the Iranian, for any authoritarian establishment, culture and art is, is a thorn at their side. They can manufacture anything, but you cannot manufacture an artist. And, and I think for them, they either have to control the arts and artists or they can't tolerate them. And, and that's essentially, and I know who I am, and, I would, uh, and I, I, I'm speaking for myself, I would never have compromised. And, and I want to touch on the word compromise. Oh, I'm coming to it. I'm coming to it okay, because that's, that's you, a, I want to end yeah, off on that. Sure, let's go. But before I do that, and I don't want to, uh, A, I don't want to, as yet, uh, but I, I also I don't want to belittle what you have done in the last 20 years because you've been involved in so many different creative projects, including making some cool music videos as well. <laughs> but when you talk about you, you would give anything to make films in Iran, yeah. the reality is, Babak, you, you were fertile as a filmmaker in Iran. You made those three films, and in the last 17 years, you've only really made one other film. Yeah. First of all, the first four years after leaving Iran, under those circumstances, I was full of rage and anger. And to the question of then, in 2008, I think this question was posed to me. Why haven't you done anything? You're so energetic, you've got so much pro And I'm saying what was yes, posed. Yes. And, and I said, listen, I was so affected by the situation and hurt by what happened to me in Iran that anything I would have done would, be, would have been in retaliation to what has happened to me. Mm -hmm. And I would have stood here before you and said, I wish I hadn't made those films. Because for those first four years, I, and, and part of my seclusion, and, and part of what has to do with that rude awakening later, was I, I went inwards and I locked because I knew anything that comes out of my mouth would, not, would be as a reaction to what had happened to me and what they had done, or, or what I thought they had done to me. And, and it took some time. But part of it also, I must confess, had to do with I was, I was lazy. I, was, uh, I wasn't as driven anymore to, 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 to prove something. I wanted, I insisted on the kinds of films. For example, over these years, I have a screenplay on the death of Caravaggio. Uh, these are all things that I'd written during these times and, and I want to. And, and I, I worked on a project that had to do with my grandparents' roots called, uh, well, I shouldn't mention the name, that would give away too much, but it's about a, a Jewish boy who leaves uh, Baku in 1918 and immigrates to Germany and becomes a prominent German author. Uh, I adapted a book by Changiz Aitmatov, The Day Lasts More Than 100 Years, and I wrote several other stories that, that Essentially, what came uh, together was making uh, Manhattan Undying as a way for me, n in a way I was being pushed in the direction of not going and making films in the East yeah. anymore. But you know, if, you, if you'll if you excuse me for saying it this way, sure. the through line is uh, we're so familiar with the stories of people whose careers, whose creativity, whose innovation, 
whose energy was stunted or cut off at the knees by the revolution. And these stories are about how it continues. Mm -hmm. You know, this wasn't the revolution. This was 20 years after the revolution. And your career, um, uh, look, whether you, whether the the, the, the the tap was dry or what or whatever it was, there's no one no one could argue that it didn't affect you. Of course, <laughs> and of course Absolutely. it is going to affect you. Absolutely, it's a harrowing experience. Your your film, your third film gets uh, of this Troika films gets completely basically taken off the market. Yeah, uh, I mean it's it's a very very um, difficult situation, and yeah. and this is the this is the sort of ongoing reality of of. Um, being an Iranian in the diaspora, I yeah. suppose, Th- which leads to uh, the other through line of this conversation, which is your commitment to not wanting to compromise. Yeah. And before we end off talking, let's get back to that piece you wrote a couple of weeks ago. And in this piece, you say politics is meaningless without comp- without compromise. Politics, where art is meaningless with compromise. You go on to repeat: true art allows for no compromises. I love that sentiment, and I know you believe you mean that. Yeah. But I want to call bullshit on it. Okay. Because I don't really believe that that's possible. If you're if you're talking about making art in in the corner of a room that you can look at and be happy about, that's one thing. But as soon as you take that art and bring it into the public realm, I don't know how you avoid the compromise. You I'm not. I'm not saying you seek the compromise, you tr- but you know, you know, this is. I mean, whether you're writing a book or you're making albums like I've made, or you're or you're you're painting a, a something and you, it has to go in a gallery, or you're making a film. At some point, you know, well, I've got to include this scene. I've got to take this out. I've got to make sure that the lighting is like this to get to the audience. So. Is it really possible to to be a person of no compromise? Not that I expected any less, but I really appreciate your astute observation. And and in a way, you also walked right into it because I have an answer (laughs) for that. I look forward to it. In the artistic discourse, and for me personally as an artist, everything has to do with compromise. However, it's not about compromise itself, but the kind of compromises you make. You may make, as a filmmaker, compromises saying, I have little budget, so I have to move into an interior scene. Right. You may, may, may make compromises and say, I have to take that action scene and turn it into you know, a fist fighting scene because I don't have the budget. But if you make compromises because of censorship, if you make compromises to pander to politics, it is in the kind of compromise that I see. you take it to the next level. In that article, I was talking about my dedication to art because it is about making no compromises in comparison and in contrast with with politics, it, which is all about compromises. But then it t- you, when you take it to the next level, as an artist, you always, as a matter of fact, the best works of art were when the artist took all the shortcomings. I, in, I experienced that in my own movies in Iran. I took all the shortcomings and all the difficulties that I had in the production and turned it into creativity and made compromises to make something good out of it. And certainly if you've ever worked with anybody else. Absolutely. I mean, unless you're going to make the film, but produce it, direct it, Absolutely. shoot it, act in it, do everything yourself and never leave the room. But the you, que- If you're in a band, if you're working with others, if you're working with a gallery, you, you, there's, there's no doubt that you have to at some point compromise. Yeah. But, th- but if I can bring it full circle and maybe in a bit of a clunky way, isn't that compromise the same thing we're talking about when it comes to the community? When you say politics is meaningless without compromise and you resent that, can't compromise also be a good thing? Shouldn't, well, shouldn't I don't think politics is bad. I just say I don't want to have anything to do with politics. I'm not a political person. I, I didn't mean, I, it wasn't Well, you did say in that piece, you say I resent politics. I resent politics, but I don't think it's bad. Resentment is not thinking it's bad. I just resent it. I might resent <laughs> something that you say, but it doesn't mean that you're a bad person. Okay. I don't want to get into semantics here, but I resent politics in the sense that I don't want to have anything to do with it. But I acknowledge that politics is essential and important in, 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 in modern society. Well, let me put it this way. But then. If you, you, know the, you know the community. Yes. How important, like again, 
again, full circle, back to unity, dis- disunity. Yes. How important is it to us in our global global Iranian diaspora for us to compromise with each other when it comes to our viewpoints and and our discussions on the way forward for us as a as as an Iranian people of Iranian background. I can't speak about, of, uh, from authority on this subject. I can just make my own observation about it. I think we have to pay attention to the kind of compromise. If the compromise we're making is pandering to the Iranian regime, if the compromise we're making is for some kind of expediency because I want to trade or whatever gotcha. and say we have to pander to that system or turn a blind eye to whatever at- atrocity that that cover, I don't want to make that compromise. I will never make that compromise. Gotcha. But if it's compromising and saying, listen, why don't you have a piece of the pie? Or why don't you, why, why don't we have, acknowledge the diversity? Th- see, again, it's all in the kind of compromise, not in compromise itself. We cannot force it down people's throats and say, compromise is a blanket statement. Why aren't you making compromises? But we say well, you can make this kind of a compromise, a compromise that we can make as a diverse culture, as a diverse society and community, is to acknowledge that diversity, acknowledge the fact that you and I will never agree on everything, but you and I must sit and work together towards a common cause. You and I might be opposed to b- teeth and, and, and nails with uh, together, but it doesn't mean that we cannot sit down and I'm not work as, on I'm, this program. I'm certainly not in, as into Pink Floyd as, as you. As I am. Yeah, that might I be like the, the band, but I mean. <laughs> not as into a design. But, but that's, uh, again, it's about the kind of compromise. And I think uh, as long as we acknowledge diversity and we acno- and build our unity on our differences, not an insistence upon eliminating those differences, That is a different perspective, and I hope to be able to make a difference. And my rude awakening was, if you believe so strongly in that, and if you don't see that happening in your community and your society, or people hitting the nail on the head the the way you see it, why don't you roll up your sleeves and try to do something about it and contribute to your community? I mean, I feel like we're just getting started, (laughs) you know? Uh, It it has been riveting, and uh, your message has been very clear. And uh, I so appreciate you taking the time and being our inaugural guest Thank here you. in the Rook studio Thank rather you. than on the phone or on Skype or something. Thanks Thank so much, Pavek. Thank you. It was a pleasure, and, and I really uh, thank you for the time and the good work that you're doing. Had I known I was the physical guest here, I would definitely have come here with some Nun Yazdi or you, you Gaz brought, or something. Just, just to be clear so the audience knows, you brought nothing. I brought nothing, Zero. and I'm totally You know, so, you I'm go so to a Persian's sorry. house, you bring nothing. Well, now so we know sorry. who the real you. I'll Bob make Ak-Payami. up for it with Nun Khomein <laughs> man, next time. <laughs> Bob Payami, an award-winning director, producer, writer. He joined me here in the Rook Studio in Toronto today. My God, on a two and Shia has chosen that speaks to Babak Payami's Iranian and Afghani roots growing up. A famous Iranian song, Sultan Qalapal, by the late, in this case, Ahmad Zahir, a very well known Afghani singer. This recording is from 1976. Thank you so much for listening today. Subscribe if you like what you're hearing. Thanks to the Rook team. We will see you all on Thursday. Merci. Mizun Bashin. Yak del me gavur, yak del me gavur, kahat na gavarat nam de tu de tu chuna. Peshe eshe vazima, hai le ko chhe dunya dunya, boya.
Allah.